Welcome to this message by Ray Stedman titled, Behind Divisions, from raystedman.org. The text for this message is from 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 19. We return this morning to 1 Californians, otherwise known as 1 Corinthians, and to the problem church of the New Testament. This Corinthian church was like a rocking chair. Lots of action there, but very little progress. And uh, as we uh, read this letter through, I think we'll see how very much like these modern-day churches, this ancient church of Corinth was. Unlike uh, most of Paul's other epistles, the apostle plunges right into the heart of the practical problems that was Uh, bothering this church, affecting this church. And the first of these, he begins uh, to deal with in chapter 1, verse 10, where we'll begin this morning. The problem of divisions within the church. I had a young man, young pastor, call me just this week from another state, and he was facing just that problem in his church. The church was divided into factions, and a group of them were urging him to take the take uh, the, half the congregation and go to another part of the city and start a new church. And he called me uh, to ask whether I thought that would be right or wrong to do. Now my answer was, it all depends on the motive. If it's to expand uh, the congregation and, and uh, further the work of the Lord in that area. And you have the whole uh, agreement of the leadership of the church behind you, then it's fine. Take part of the congregation and go away and begin another work. This would be fine. But if it's to escape pressures and difficulties and problems in the congregation, then it's absolutely wrong. And the worst thing you could do, because it it uh, sets before the watching world a false testimony concerning the church of Jesus Christ. Now, the Apostle Paul is very concerned about this matter of incipient division in the church at Corinth. And he begins dealing with it with this powerful appeal for unity in verse 10. I appeal to you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no dissensions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Paul always expresses great concern about the possibility of a split in a church. If you'll recall, some of you may be reminded by these words in verse 10 of the of a similar passage in his letter to the Philippians, where in chapter 2, he says to that church, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any incentive of love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. And you recall that in writing to the church at Ephesus, he, he, admit, he exhorted the elders there to be careful to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. Now, church unity is a very important matter. And Paul puts it at the very first of the list of problems he has to deal with here at Corinth because of its significance. Many of the other problems were were flowing out of this one problem, this division within the congregation. And here in this verse, uh, verse 10, he briefly shows us the ground of unity and the nature of unity in a church. The ground, of course, is the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I appeal to you, he says, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
It was their relationship to Christ that was the unifying factor of a church. There's no other name big enough and great enough and uh, glorious enough and powerful enough to gather everybody together despite the diversity of a viewpoint and the differences of background and the differences of status or station in life than the name of Jesus. No other name can unify a church but that name. That's why the apostle appeals to it. They, uh, he recognizes, as he does everywhere, that we share a common life if we've come to Christ. We are brothers and sisters because we have his life in us. That's the ground always of unity. And more than that, we have a responsibility to obey him, to follow his lordship. And therefore, the only basis upon you, which you can really get Christians to agree together is when you set before them the person of the Lord Jesus and you call them back to that fundamental base. This is what Paul does here. Christ is the ground of unity of the church. And the nature of unity, you'll notice, he, he describes this way, that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Now that does not mean everybody has to think alike. That would be impossible. With all the differences among us, we just, it's impossible to get people to think alike. Uh, obviously, here at Peninsula Bible Church, we can't do that. It would be great if you all would think like me. <laughs> but unfortunately, there are stubborn ones among you. <laughs> there are depraved ones among you. <laughs> there are those who have different uh, backgrounds than I have, and you just don't think like I do, some of you. And that, of, of course, is as it should be. No, the church is never called to uh, think, everybody think exactly alike. And yet, as the apostle says, they're to be of the same mind. Well, now, how could that be? I think here the letter to the Philippians helps us, because in that passage I just quoted from Philippians, Paul goes on to say, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to, to describe for us the mind of Christ, which is a willingness to give up rights and personal privileges and give in and take a lower place. There comes that great Christological passage where he describes how Christ though he was in the form of God and equal with God, did not think it something to be held on to, but laid it aside and became a servant among us. And having become a servant, became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. That's the mind that he's talking about. What brings harmony in a congregation is when everybody decides to put the things of Christ first and be willing to suffer loss themselves that the honor and glory of Christ might be advanced. That's always the unifying factor in a church. And that's the mind that's to be among us, a mind that does not consider itself the most important thing. I remember well being a few years ago at the Family Congress in St. Louis, Missouri, and one of the evening speakers was Dr. Oswald Huffman, the very capable and, and uh, powerful preacher on the Lutheran Hour. Some of you have heard him on the radio. Dr. Huffman was introduced in a rather extended introduction, rather flowery introduction. And he came on, and in his great booming voice, he said, I'm not Dr. Oswald Huffman the great preacher of the Lutheran hour, I'm nobody, just like you. <laughs> and I have not forgotten that incident because it seems to me to capture the very attitude Paul is saying here. 
Who are we that we should put our interests and our desires ahead of that for his, uh, of the Lord for his church? I've been in many places where they were having church fights, and church quarrels. And almost invariably, the, the, the thing that gives it away that a church is in trouble is that people start talking about my church. Uh, not in the sense of, it, which is perfectly proper of saying, meaning the church where I go, but people actually saying, leaders of the church saying, this is our church. And telling other people they have no rights to do something here because this belongs to us. And forgetting, of course, that the church never belongs to anybody but the Lord. It's the Lord's church. And this is what Paul uses as the basis of unity in this church. Not only the the attitude of selflessness, which is the mind of Christ, but the responsibility to, to submit to his lordship, the common responsibility that we have together. Now, I'm not going to dwell with that but because Paul does not, but he goes right on to describe the forms that these divisions were taking in the church at Corinth. The, the uh, description is given in verse 12. What I mean, he says, is that each one of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, which is another uh, name for Peter, or I belong to Christ. Now there was the trouble at Corinth. These were not schisms yet. They hadn't split off into other congregations, but they were cliques factions within the congregation. And there were four of them. There were, first of all, the loyalists who said, we are of Paul. Paul started this church. He was the apostle who came to us. We came to life in Christ by Paul. And Paul is the one we're going to listen to above all others. And so there was a great group of them, undoubtedly, that followed Paul. Then there were the stylists, those who uh, were attracted by the different kinds of preaching, and especially had they been drawn to Apollos. From the New Testament, uh, from the book of Acts, we learn that Apollos was an outstanding orator in a world that loved and appreciated oratory in that day. He was a rhetorician, and uh, he especially uh, uh, was capable in the allegorical style of teaching of the Old Testament. And I'm sure there were many in Corinth who were saying, oh, I love to hear Apollos. He just makes the Old Testament come alive to me. When he speaks, I just am caught up with all that... He's describing, and I love to listen to Apollos because he is a great preacher and can make the Old Testament live, a warm, uh, capable, eloquent man. And so there was a group saying, we are of Apollos. And then there were the traditionalists, there always are, those who say, well, I don't know about Paul or Apollos. But let's get back to the beginnings. Let's go back to Jerusalem. We are of Peter. Well, Peter evidently had been through there and preached as well. And they said, oh, when Peter came, we really felt that we were on solid ground then. After all, he was one of the first apostles that Jesus himself had called. Peter, the leader of the twelve. And therefore, when you get back to Peter, you're back to solid ground. And so they were splitting and arguing and, and quarreling over the uh, relative merit and authority of these various ones. Then there was still a fourth group. And in some ways, I think they were probably the worst. They were drawing themselves up and saying, well, you may be of Paul or Peter or Apollos or... Sm Schmoz, it doesn't make any difference. 
who it is. We, we are of Christ. We go back to the Lord alone. What he says we'll listen to. And Paul or Peter or anyone else makes no difference to us. We only take the words of Christ. And so, with that spirit of self-righteous smugness, they were separating from the rest and dividing up the congregation and quarreling with one another over these things. Now, you don't have to be very old to recognize that that's still a problem in the church. Same viewpoints are still dividing people. There are those who are emotionally attached to some great Christian leader who has helped them, and that's all they'll listen to. That's, they'll, they read his books or listen to his tapes, and that's all they'll pay any attention to. They don't want to hear anyone else. There are others who are drawn to some speaking style that has attracted them. They love to listen to someone because he turns them on emotionally. There are others today who follow after some school of thought. It's the popular thing today to, uh, to cry back to the Reformation. And if anybody will come on preaching the doctrines that were emphasized during the Reformation, they'll get a great following of people who, who think the, <clears throat> the Reformation was the whole sum and substance of all great Christian truth. And others will pick other matters of doctrine to affirm the there are the Calvinists and the Arminians and the Dispensationalists, and these are all the things that are held up as the, as the summum bonum, the highest good in theology. I think if you survey the uh, church scene in America today, you'll find people dividing up this way all over. Some say, I am of Gothard. <laughs> and others say, no, I am of Bright. And still others, well, we are of Schaefer. And others, we are of Graham. And some, we are of Lewis, C.S. Lewis. And so you have these divisions. You find them, there's tendencies this way, I find right here in Peninsula Bible Church. Some are of Ritchie. <laughs> and some are of Roper. And a few of Stedman. And so we have the possibility for this very thing right here. Now Paul says it's all wrong. It's basically, fundamentally wrong. It is the source of much trouble and difficulty whenever this attitude of gathering around a man is allowed to perpetuate itself. Uh, and then he goes on to tell us why. In verse 13, he gives us three very carefully stated clues as to what is wrong with this kind of thing. But first, it's very clear that he's deeply troubled by this. When you divide up among men, you lose something. That's what he's saying. It's a serious threat to the life of a church to find people choosing favorite preachers to the degree at least that they don't want to listen to anyone else. Now, we all have our favorite preacher and up to a point that's not wrong. There are people who get to us, minister to us better than others and it's only natural that we should listen to them and follow them. But it's the exclusiveness that Paul is concerned about here. And people who rule out and don't even want to come to a service if someone else is preaching other than their favorite. That's what's wrong. That's what Paul speaks about. Now in verse 13, you, you understand why. To all of this, Paul would say to us, as he says to Corinth, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now, here are our first clues as to what is wrong with this kind of clickishness in the church. The 
The first thing Paul says is it tends to chop up Christ and parcel him out as though his person and his work came in various packages. And thus you lose perspective of the whole of Christian theology. You see, when you follow one man, you're, only, you're getting a view of Christ. Now, there's no teacher in the church that's ever come along, including the Apostle Paul himself, who's ever had a totally complete view of Christ. That's why we have four Gospels, because not even one of the disciples who were with the Lord was capable of giving us a, a, a complete enough view of Christ. Took four viewpoints to even report his earthly life and ministry accurately enough to us. And nobody is able to give us a, a complete enough view of Christ to warrant following that man and that only. God, therefore, has designed there be many teachers in a church, many preachers, many viewpoints. In the body of Christ at large, there would be many who would make a contribution to the understanding of Christ. And you see, if you limit yourself to just one speaker or one teacher and feed only on him, you are getting a distorted view of Jesus Christ. You're chopping Christ up and dividing him and taking one little portion, as one man reports it, and ignoring the rest. And thus your view of Christ becomes defeated, uh, uh, deficient, and unable to satisfy you as it was intended to do. Now, the second thing Paul says is, is put this way, was Paul crucified for you? There he indicates that the problem with cliquishness is it tends to overemphasize the significance of the human leader. It builds him up too much. It makes him uh, a rival to some degree of the Lord himself. And people begin to think things about him that aren't true, that he can't do, and expect things from him that he's unable to deliver on. This is always true. There's a tendency to deify men. You only have to listen around you today, and you'll find outstanding leaders today being held up by their congregations as, the, as almost the equal of the Lord himself in, in their value to the church. We tend to deify men. People look at them and, as though they can do no wrong and make no errors, that they know everything and can settle all questions. I've had to do some degree of battle with this myself. I've had people say to me, Oh, Mr. Stedman, when you speak, I just, I just see so clearly, and uh, I, I hang on every word you say, whatever you say, I believe. Now, I've been trying to get my wife to accept that <laughs> for a long time. But that's a dangerous attitude, a very dangerous attitude. And uh, yet it's a tendency. For us to think of people as being the means, the channel by which deliverance can come to our heart. Now it can't. Paul's putting his finger right on the problem when he asks, was, Christ, was Paul crucified for you? There isn't a single Christian teacher that ever lived who can help us for, be forgiven one single sin. Not one. There isn't a single teacher that ever lived that can heal the hurt of a broken heart or supply energy and adequacy to someone who feels worthless and unable to function in society. Not one. There isn't a teacher among us today or any other time that is able to open the mind and open the eyes of the heart and reveal to us the glory and majesty of God. Not one. That's not the work of men. That's the work of God himself. 
and he chooses various channels through which to work. And we must allow him the privilege of doing that. They won't all be the same flavor. They won't all have the same characteristics. And somehow or another, we reveal our immaturity when we insist that only those with certain characteristics are the ones that we'll listen to or feel can bless or strengthen our life. No man is the Savior. No man can deliver us except Jesus. All are mere teachers. There's only one Lord. He said so himself. One is your master. All you are brothers. Then the third danger of groups is given in verses 13, the latter part there, and on through the next few verses. Paul says, Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Then he adds, I'm thankful that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that you were baptized in my name. And then he thinks of another group that he had baptized. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. Now here the apostle makes very clear that the tendency among groupies is to distort the meaning of symbols. They take an innocent teaching medium, as in this case baptism, and make it into an identification badge. Now that's the problem, and it's still going on today, isn't it? How many of us have, uh, are familiar with this, this uh, common phenomenon in, uh, in human psychology of uh, thinking that some symbolic thing that is of use to us is so important that we finally make it a badge of the group to which we belong. I remember as a young Christian in my early 20s, during World War II, I was stationed in, the, in uh, Hawaii, and I became acquainted with the work of the Navigators. At that time, it was under the leadership of the founder of the Navigators, Dawson Trotman, and it was my privilege and delight to be a close friend of Dawson Trotman, to know him personally and to have spent a good deal of time with him and to come under the influence of his teaching and of his methods. And uh, the navigators in those days did a great work throughout the whole of the, of the uh, uh, Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans in the Navy. And uh, hundreds of young men were led to Christ through their efforts during the war year. I used to attend a navigator group met in Honolulu on Sunday afternoons, and sometimes two or three hundred sailors would be there together, all of them Christians, from various ships out through the Pacific. We had some great meetings, great times together. It was a glorious work. But you could always tell a navigator for three things that he always had. First, he had a Schofield reference Bible tucked under his arm. Somehow or another, the Schofield Reference Bible was uh, pushed by the navigators, and everybody had to have one. And since I was working at that time in the ship service department in, in Honolulu, in uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, we ordered in great quantities of Schofield Reference Bibles. They were difficult to get in those war years. But every, every shipment that came in just went out like hotcakes. Because every navigator had to have a Schofield reference Bible. That was the only authorized version. And then not only did they have the Bible, but on every navigator that was anybody at all had to have an index on the pages of the Bible that was drawn in, a kind of a ladder that gave you a clue to where the books were. And you could, with your thumb, turn to those and... Uh, turn up any book of the Bible almost instantly. And if you were really on the inside circle, your ladder was drawn by none other than Dawson Trotman himself. 
and I still have at home the Schofield Reference Bible <laughs> that I have with the index ladder drawn by Dawson Trotman himself. And then there was a third thing that every navigator had. He had a little black notebook about the same size as my New Testament here. Always rough uh, grained leather, black, and opening it you always found a loose leaf notebook with many of the small half page material that the navigators printed their Bible helps on. And you could see them, you could spot them going up and down the streets of Honolulu. You'd have a Schofield reference Bible and a notebook under one arm. And you knew that sooner or later, they, if you examined their Bible, you'd find the latter index on the pages. That was the mark. That was the identification badge. Now, these things were good. Nothing wrong with them. They were very helpful things and useful. But it wasn't very long before they became status symbols. And they were used to put down in a always not intended way, but uh, nevertheless used to put down those who didn't have them. And soon they became symbols of prestige and standing that became divisive factors among the men. Now it's always true. Almost every group does this. Something shows up sooner or later as an identifying badge that marks them off as special, with special privilege and special status in that group. That's what they were doing here at Corinthian, at, at Corinth with baptism. They were boasting over who had baptized them. And uh, some of them were saying, well, Paul baptized me. And others were saying, well, <laughs> uh, Apollos himself baptized me. And there were some who said, well, Peter, when he came through, he baptized me. And you know, after all, Peter even walked on water. <laughs> and that was a mark of status with them. So they were dividing over this whole issue. And Paul says, it's all wrong. It's all destructive. It will destroy the unity of the congregation and split you up and, and provide an inaccurate testimony as to the person of Christ before the watching world. And so he, he says, I thank God only a few of you can do that about me. I didn't baptize many of you. Just Crispus and Gaius and, oh yes, the household of Stephanus. And that's all. And I'm glad there were no others because I don't want you dividing up like this. And then in one verse, verse 17, he introduces to us the cure to these divisions. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, that is literally wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. This introduces a wonderful passage here in 1 Corinthians, one of the greatest passages in the Bible to set forth the difference between the wisdom of men and the wisdom of God. We're going to go on that into our next study after Easter on this passage. But Paul here introduces that which can cure divisions, both negatively and positively. He says, in effect, you don't cure divisions in a church by identification badges. Christ did not send me to take scalps or to notch, get notches on my gun handle as to how many converts I've won. Now, he isn't saying that it's wrong to baptize. He himself did it and acknowledges he did. He doesn't say that we should stop baptizing because it has this problem. No, he says, that isn't why I was sent. I wasn't sent to emphasize symbols. But positively, I was sent to preach a whole gospel, not one emphasizing style, not in wisdom of words, but that which emphasizes content. 
It's the fact of the gospel, the facts in the gospel that will set us free. And particularly, he says, the word of the cross, the cross of Christ. That's what will heal the broken fragmentation of Christians wherever they are. When you call them back to an understanding of the meaning of the cross, you'll find all the divisions disappearing. They just fade away like the morning mist. When you get men's eyes off all these status symbols among you and call them back away from the following of men to the person of Christ and his cross, all the divisions will disappear. There's been no other cure that I know of through the years. The cross of Christ cuts across all human value systems. It wipes out all the petty distinctions that men make among themselves. The cross strips away our illusions and brings the pride of men tumbling down from that high place where it exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And Paul's going to go on now to describe this force, this radical force that is so different from anything else. There's nothing like it in the world. No man would ever have planned the cross if it had been left up to us to plan the program by which God would change the world. We'd never have included a cross. This is a radical principle that we need to understand. Because when you understand the cross, there will be no room left for the divisions of men. That's why Paul calls us back to it. This is a very propitious time for us to consider the cross. For this week, as you know, is Holy Week. This is Palm Sunday. When our Lord entered Jerusalem for his last week facing the cross. And on Friday of this week, we will gather again here to consider the cross of Christ on Good Friday. And as we do, I hope every one of us will understand more and more fully the character of this radical principle that God has turned loose among us, this revolutionary idea represented in the cross of Christ that wipes out all these distinctions among men. I'd just like to close this service by reading Uh, something that was written not long ago about the cross. One man said, It is well that we should think sometimes of the upper room and the last supper, and of his soul exceeding sorrowful unto death, of Gethsemane in the deep shadow of the olive trees, his loneliness, prayers, and disappointment with his disciples, his bloody sweat, the traitor's kiss, the binding, the blow in the face, the spitting, the buffeting, the mocking, the scourging, the crown of thorns, the smiting, the sorrowful way and the burdensome cross, the exhaustion and collapse, the stripping, the impaling, and the jeers of his foes and the flight of his friends, the hours on the cross, the darkness, his being forsaken of God, his thirst, and the end. Near the cross, O Lamb of God, bring its scenes before me. Help me walk from day to day with its shadows o'er me. Let's close the service by singing number 58, just a verse or two of this. When I survey the water, we thank you for this time here contemplating the cross. We pray that it may be rich and real in our hearts as we live this week together. And let it do its great work, Lord, of cutting down and eliminating from our lives those things over which we take pride and which separate us from others. Those distinctions, Lord, that make us dislike our brother or sister and uh, turn our backs upon them. Help us, Lord, to judge these in the light of the cross and by its light walk before thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Say
shaken. I was shattered by the fall, broken and forgotten, feeling lost and all alone. Summoned by the king into the master's courts, lifted by the savior and cradled in his arms. I was carried to the table.
Salvation, whoa, whoa. 